It's really an honor to be here. Um, very grateful for this opportunity, so thank you guys. Um, uh, first and foremost, you guys are a super special group. Um, got to spend the last few days around around you guys. I got to go to the awards show last night, and uh, yeah, you guys are like a big family. I've never seen anything like this, so whatever you're doing, keep doing it. So um, again, yeah, thanks for this opportunity. And um, after we're, I'll probably speak for 15 or 20 minutes, and then um, please ask any question you have. You know, the tougher ones, the better. I pre so um, please don't hold back. Um, the Tour de France is arguably the world's most difficult athletic event. It's 21 days of racing, over 2,500 miles, or what's that, 4,000 kilometers, on some of the world's most punishing roads. It's like running a marathon every day for three weeks. I raced the Tour de France eight times and put every ounce of energy into that race. Getting to that final finish line in Paris was a feat in itself. But during those years, finish lines were not the only lines being crossed. Cycling had a dark side, a side I wasn't ready for and one that pushed me over a line I thought I'd never cross. And once on the other side, there was no going back. It was the beginning of a double life filled with secrets and lies that would destroy me from the inside long after I left the sport. Johnny Cash once said, lies have to be covered up, but truths can run around naked. This is my story about lies and the truth and what happens when you compromise your values to chase a dream, and how one bad decision can snowball into so many more. It's also about realizing that no matter how bad things get or how impossible a situation seems, there's always a way out. When I started racing, I realized I had a special ability to endure pain. It might sound strange, but pain is something I've always been good at. It comes from my family. My dad would tell me when I was a kid that it's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. Hamiltons are tough. Another Hamilton trait was honesty. My parents didn't put many demands on us, but the one thing they wouldn't put up with was lying. Tell the truth or else, no matter what. Tough and honest, those are my folks. Tough and honest, with those traits, I thought I could handle just about anything. And when it came to racing, I always knew I could outwork anyone and that I could win at the highest level on grit and a willingness to suffer alone. When I arrived at the top level of cycling, I did what I knew best. I worked my tail off and I never gave up. During that time, there was a word I kept hearing the Europeans say. Paniagua, that said that guy's doing well even though he's Paniagua, or he'll never finish today, it's too hard, he's, and he's Paniagua. Eventually I found out what they were saying was Spanish, pan y agua. Translated to English it means bread and water. In other words, racing clean without performance enhancing drugs. During that time, I noticed the top guys on, our, on my team getting these little white lunch bags from the team doctors after every race. I didn't know what was in them, but I knew I wasn't getting one. And then I figured out what was going on. And that became my motivation to work even harder to prove I didn't need one. But unfortunately, things were about to change. One night, after a tough week-long race in Spain, there I was in my hotel room, collapsed on my bed, physically depleted, completely exhausted. The team doctors knew I was hurting, and one of them, Pedro Salaya, came in to check on me. He was concerned and sympathetic, almost fatherly. He told me how hard I had worked, how much I had pushed through the pain, and that he admired that in me. But I had to start taking care of my body, he said, make myself healthier. 
Pedro always wore this fly fishing vest and he reached, that had all these small little pockets and he reached into one of them and pulled out a little red egg shaped capsule. A little red egg shaped, um, yeah, little red egg shaped capsule. And he said, Tyler, this is for your health. It's not doping, it's for your health. He handed me the capsule and there I was at the crossroads, in or out, yes or no. I swallowed the red egg without much thought and it was testosterone, a banned substance. Of course, I knew it was against the rules, but I had worked so hard and it was so close to my dream of riding in the Tour de France. I felt that, like I owed it to myself to look the other way. And I justified it. I told myself everybody was doing it and it was a necessary part of competing at the top level. But I knew it was wrong and deep down I was ashamed. But that shame was buried by a new feeling of possibility. How far can I go? How fast can I ride? How good can I be? In a strange way, it was a badge of honor. It meant the team finally thought I was good enough to get a white lunch bag. Now on the inner circle, I was next led to injections of a drug called EPO, or Edgar Allan Poe, as we called it. <laughs> um, EPO increases the production of red blood cells, which carry oxygen to the muscles. And, and it also improves endurance. With EPO, we can train harder and, and then longer. And in a three-week race like the Tour de France, EPO was an absolute game changer. At the time, EPO was undetectable and it was fast and easy. A quick swab of the arm, a little injection, and done. Like the red egg, it didn't feel like a big deal. In the beginning, EPO and all the other drugs were given, paid for, administered, and transported by the team. Because it was, because it was all done for us, we reasoned it was the team actually breaking the rules. And we, the riders, were just the dutiful employees. But that situation changed after the 1998 Tour de France, when a French, um, yeah, when a French team vehicle w uh, was raided by the police and they uncovered a massive amount of doping products. From that point on, it became too risky for the team to manage our doping program. We would now have to do it all ourselves. Team management told us the new system was for safety, but now the risk of transporting and border crossing was all on us. Since there would be no EPO in the team cars anymore, how would we get it during the tour? Our team leader, Lance Armstrong, came up with a plan. His gardener, Philippe, or Motoman as we nicknamed him, would zip through the Tour de France circus on his motorcycle and drop off the syringes to an undercover staff member. The, the staff member would have our syringes waiting for us, sometimes tucked in our sneakers or in our race bags. We would inject quickly, 30 seconds at the most, thro throw the syringes into an empty Coke can, and we'd crush the cans to make them look like trash. And the team doctor would bury the cans in the bottom of his backpack, open the door, walk out past the fans, journalists, and even police. So there we were in the middle of one of the world's biggest sporting events, injecting banned drugs just feet from thousands of people. People always want to know why we didn't get caught. Weren't there drug tests? Of course there were, and plenty of them. Um, but if you follow the doctor's instructions or cheat sheets, none of them were hard to beat. I passed hundreds of tests when I shouldn't have, and in the 1990s, there was no test for EPO at all. In 2000, that changed. The team was warned by an inside source that an EPO test could be used at the upcoming tour. We need, needed a new strategy. To work around the EPO test, the team decided to try a safer alternative. A couple weeks before the tour, I boarded a private jet with Lance and another teammate and flew down to Valencia, 
Below us, we could see the French Riviera, the mansions, and the yachts. It felt like a fantasy world. When we landed, the team doctors told us how easy this new method would be, how safe it was, and how, it was, and how, um, how there was absolutely nothing to worry about. What they were talking about was blood transfusions, or blood doping. I'd heard about transfusions before, but I couldn't believe athletes actually did them. <coughs> Doctors will extract your blood, store it in a fridge, refrigerator, or freezer, and then reinfuse it back into you when your body is depleted. It has the same red blood cell boosting effect that EPO has, only this was natural. But in reality, it was a risky, dangerous procedure with serious consequences if done improperly. Blood transfusions are not the same as swallowing a pill or getting an injection. Here you're watching a big clear bag fill up with your own warm red blood. You never forget it and you never get used to it. And when you're leaving in the hands of doctors with questionable pass, things can go wrong. After one visit, I left the doctor's office in a hurry. Hailing a cab with one arm, I felt a strange wetness on the other. I looked down and saw my hand dripping with blood and my sleeve completely soaked in red. It looked as though I'd been stabbed. The hole from the extraction needle hadn't closed. That point in time characterized exactly what my life had become. There I was on a busy street corner in Madrid, hiding behind dark glasses and a baseball hat, paranoid of being seen. In one hand, I'm holding a cell phone filled with secret code names and numbers, and the other hand is dripping with blood. And down the street in a backroom clinic, a doctor I don't trust is stockpiling bags of my blood, all for a bike race. People ask me, why wasn't that enough to make me stop it all right then and there? My reality was so twisted by then, I reasoned it was just temporary. My career would be over in a couple of years, and once it was done, I'd, be, I'd go back to living a normal life. So there I was, at the top of the pack, cruising up and over the French Alps and Pyrenees, the Italian Dolomites, and the Belgian Ardennes winning at the highest level in some of the most famous bike races in the world. I was now the elite of the elite. I fulfilled my childhood dream of becoming an Olympic champion. I truly made it. I was living the American dream, and my family was so proud. Invitations came rolling in, ring the opening bell on Wall Street, threw out the first pitch at the Boston Red Sox game, nationally televised interviews, these wins, these accomplishments, these highs should have made me feel like I was on top of the world. Yet my life was spinning out of control and I worried more about getting caught than I did about winning. So what could I, but what could I do? I already walked into the casino and rolled the dice. I was in over my head. There was no turning around and no way out. But then it all came to a screeching halt. It was the 2004 Tour of Spain. I was at the peak of my cycling career and I got the news. I'd failed a drug test. Another person's cells were detected in my blood. I assumed that the blood bags had been mixed. It was a mistake that could have killed me. There was my moment, my opportunity to finally do the right thing tell the truth, take responsibility, leave all this behind, and start my life over. Instead, with the pressure mounting, I lied. Professional cycling was a brotherhood. We lived by the emerita, a code of silence we all understood. We protected each other, we protected the system. Lying and denying was what I was supposed to, to do. You get caught, you say nothing, you take one for the team. That's how it was done. 
If I told the truth, I would have to implicate everyone involved. Dozens of people, many of them my friends, would lose their jobs, and I'd be blackballed from the sport forever. I received a two-year suspension. For 14 years, I lied to everyone. Not even my parents knew. During that time, I had two faces. One person, one was the person they thought I was, and the other, the other person, the one I knew I was, a doper and a liar who was unraveling on the inside. I dealt with depression, I abused alcohol, I had suicidal thoughts and feelings of self-hate that never went away. I was alone and a prisoner of my decisions. I retired in 2009. Six years after I rode my last Tour de France, a subpoena arrived at my front door. There was a federal investigation underway into Lance Armstrong and the US Postal Service cycling team. I was ordered to testify in front of a grand jury. The choice in front of me was stark. Tell the truth or go to jail. When I walked into that courtroom, I knew what I had to do. From the very first question, the truth came pouring out, and for the next seven hours, I unloaded more than a decade of lies. The more I talked, the more I realized I had spent the last 14 years protecting a culture that was never worth protecting. I was breaking the omerta and the unwritten rule of the brotherhood giving testimony that would destroy careers, hopes, dreams, and lives. But in that moment, I was free. Would I have come clean had my back not been against the wall? If nothing had changed and I still believed I had a responsibility to, to protect the sport, the answer is probably not. Being forced to testify gave me clarity, and it gave me the courage to take back my life. For 14 years, I believed the truth would ruin me. In the end, the truth saved me. While my story happened in cycling, every industry has its own unwritten rules, its own secret race. Corporate corruption is widespread. Academic cheating is at an all-time high. And a growing number of people in the workplace feel they have to bend the rules to get ahead. Whether the, re the rewards are money, fame, personal validation, a promotion, or a scholarship, the pressure to excel is taking its toll. Every day we're presented with red eggs, moments when the lure of success or fear of failure puts us to the test. Should you fudge that number just this once to meet your sales quota? Do you inflate your resume to get that dream job? Do you turn a blind eye when your boss overcharges the customer? I wish I had been better prepared for that day Pedro walked into my hotel room. I wish I had thought harder about swallowing that first red egg, about where it would lead and how out of control things would get. I wish I had known how numb victories would seem when they were achieved dishonestly. And I wish I knew then that giving back an Olympic gold medal would feel better than winning it. Thank you, guys. That's it. So, yeah, please ask a lot of questions. Um, and yeah, feel free to ask the tough ones. Come on. Okay. Just go back to that first time. Yeah. If you hadn't have taken drugs there, would you just be new to the team? I think, if it, you know, it would have been nice to try to compete. I look back and I wish I had given it a go, given it a, a full effort on, you know, bread and water, Paniagua. But I think eventually I would have had to, I would have, you know, pack my bags and head at home, you know. I think I would have seen the light and seen 
you know, that I won't, wouldn't been able to compete, you know, with the, with the best. Far from it. Yes. Um, at the start of the speech, you talked about your family values. Yeah. Do you think that that helps you protect some of it later in your life? <sighs> yeah, for whatever reason, I, you know, I, w I backed up to the edge to, to protect them, to protect my old, you know, mates. Um, yeah. I don't, you know, looking back at, yeah, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know, it's, I w my head was not clear for sure. But um, yeah, for some s strange ways, for whatever reason, yeah, I mean, I backed up right to the edge of that cliff and it was either, you know, tell the truth or, you know, go to jail and, you know, or jump off the cliff basically. And, you know, finally, that was when I realized, all right, this has gone way too far, you know. And as soon as I went into that grand jury room and started telling the truth, it was, it was like a oh, huge weight just coming off my back and it really changed my life forever. So I feel lucky. Yes. Hey, how's it going? Hey, but that was a good question. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do some. I do a talks once in a while um, with both Usada and Wada. Um, what about directly with young guys? Yeah, I talk a lot at like schools, um, and I think that's. I think that's really imp uh, not a whole lot of bike riders. You know, I don't know USA Cycling. I don't think I'm. I'm sort of persona non grata, which is okay. I, I understand. I understand. I mean, I used. If I was my old self, I wouldn't like the, my new self, anyways. So, um, you know, maybe time will heal some of these relationships but um you know i do what i can i you know i don't do this full time i but I, when i do get called called to come speak you know i usually don't i don't bat an eye um last week i spoke at, at the, at the anti-doping authority in brazil in front of me some of the athletes and you know i think giving back's the least i can do good question yes sir no nope. Yeah, yeah. Well, for me, I mean, for me, it was the ultimate. I dreamed of what I, I remember watching the 1980 Olympics uh, when I was a kid, watching Eric Hyden win the U.S. speed skater win five gold medals in Lake Placid, and then watching the U.S. hockey team beat the Soviets and then go on to win the gold. And it was amazing. And I was like, you know, I don't care what sport it, it's in, but I wanted to win a gold medal. For a long time, I was hoping that was going to be downhill ski racing, but that didn't pan out. Um, you know, the, the highest achievement in cycling is winning the Tour de France. You know, that, that was definitely my objective for a couple of years there. Um, but to win gold was, un, you know, unbelievable, surreal. But, you know, when I did get on that, you know, I dreamed about it for a long time. And when I did finally win a gold medal and get on the podium there, and it didn't feel like it should have. And that was a, that was a sign for sure. Uh, yes, sir. Good question, though. Yes, sir. Tyler, um, I was speaking to myself in here today, but thanks for the shares. From our perspective, working with players and young athletes, yeah. we, um, if I take South Africa, for example, just to take it out of the room, you made a decision when you were there and you were in the environment. Our biggest challenge is we got, we got people from backgrounds and they just want to get out of that background, they want to get out of that. Yeah. Do something for themselves, their family, their community. Yeah. In some ways, the way to do that is to get bigger, to get stronger, to be able to play rugby or to pursue your athletic career. Yep. And so, doping is the way in which they can get there. And then maybe they, they give up the doping, but they've got to get there. Yeah. Are we going to win this fight, or is there, is there an angle here? I mean, we're talking a really developed country with a very strong sports team, doping regime, testing regime, etc. But when you look at some of the developing nations, It's a, it's going to be a tough. Uh, first of all, great question. Uh, it's going to it's a tough fight for sure. You know, now is the time to you know dig our boots even deeper and like to push push harder than ever because you know now 
the amount of um, pressure to succeed just in all of life these days is more than ever, you know, more than we've ever seen. And so, and that being said, yeah, we have to work even harder to, to against this, you know, the fight against doping. Um, is it ever going to be go away and be completely clean? I don't, I don't know. It's, you know, it is human nature to cut corners, you know, to get ahead of, you know, the next guy or gal. Um, but it's a tough fight. We have to we have to keep fighting and fighting hard. You know, um, Wada Usada they they began around I think the year 2000 or so. Um, Travis Tiger told me that they really didn't even get into full swing until about 2005. So that means they've only existed for about a decade and they've made massive you know massive improvements. You know they didn't even have an EPO test until the year 2000. You know and the amount of testing was pretty infrequent. Um, you know, now they're doing out of competition testing and uh, we have Graham Steele over here who's the man here in New Zealand and he's, I've been talking to him a bunch about just ways to help and, you know, ways to educate the athletes. Um, but yeah, there's a, it's a, we have a fight on our hands, that's for sure. Um, but we just need to keep working hard. But again, yeah, you know, USADA, WADA, they've only existed and a lot of these other ADAs have for a much shorter amount of time. You know, Brazil, for example, they've only existed for a year. So I try to look at the positives here. You know, we know, we know not all a sport is totally clean. You know, it's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. Um, we've made a huge strides in the last decade in terms of anti-doping. And, you know, let's think, I can't wait to see it in another decade, what it's, li what it's like. And I think, you know, I think we have, uh, reason to have a lot of hope. That's for sure. That's for sure. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned that you've got inside source just before 2000. Oh, yeah. You know, about ETA testing. Yeah. So the perception was further than just the, the athletes. How far did the perception go? Pretty I don't know. I can't speak for other sports, but in cycling, it was pretty deep. It's still there. I, I, yeah, I, I don't know anymore. I'm kind of outside of that inner circle or far away from that inner circle. But um, yeah, in my opinion, the, uh, the Emerita is still in full existence, you know. Though some of the walls have been broken down a little bit, but the, there's still plenty of, uh, plenty of work to do there. Yeah. Um, you know, I lied about, you know, I got caught and then I lied for a long time. I, in, you know, I understand the first, that first instinct to, like, you know, not want to come out and tell the truth. But I think... I think we've all seen just, you know, what's happened in the sport of cycling. And I think, you know, a lot of these, you know, some of my old uh, competitors that are now retired from the sport and, you know, they're in director roles or managerial roles. Um, I think it's important to kind of maybe let release the ego a little bit and come forward and just be honest. And I think, you know, the more we learn about the past, uh, you know, the stronger we're going to get in the future. Because if we don't really, if the, the, the walls of the Emeritus stay solid, you know, we're going to have the same problem again in the future. Good question. Yes, sir. Yeah, in, in this room, you've probably got 100% of people here who uh, you know, believe in anti-doping and, and all the rest of it. You've got, a, you've got an audience that's convinced. Yeah. Um, but why do you actually say that influential, influential kids? who might have people around them, and at the start of their careers, if you're talking to them, rather than talking to a bunch of adults, what kind of advice are you saying to the young kids who have people around them who could be given? Yeah, well, number one, they have to listen to your gut. You know, your gut's all, you know, pretty, pretty much always right. You have to listen to your gut. You have to know the difference between right and wrong. And I think, you know, you know what's happened to me, what's happened to Lance Armstrong, what's happened to really the whole sport of cycling is a like, a good reason to you know stay on that straight line, and I think you know hearing the stories. I think that's important for the young kids. Um, you know, it's not just cycling. You know, we, we've seen it back in the states in baseball and in football. A lot of these big big athletes are you know are fa having massive falls from grace, and um, it's a good lesson. It's a great lesson, actually. You know, I started. I turned professional in uh, 1995, and you know. Nobody talked about the the sport of cycling was you know already already rotten in its core when I arrived, and uh, or when I started we got to the big leagues in 1997. But you know nobody talked about it then. Um, I mean just the fact that you know what we've seen over the last five years that is you know it's sad, but. I
but it's also the truth and, and the reality. And I think that's going to help um, help kids kind of see the big picture and like, wow, you know, I can if I make this one small decision, this one little red egg can lead to uh, some major loss. So I, all I can, you know, I I think it's important to speak as much as possible. Anybody who will listen, and uh, you know, hopefully others will do the same. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, it's you know hard, but you know, once I told the truth and the, just the, the the amount of that that massive weight, uh, it was like it was like I was carrying a hundred kilogram backpack in my back, and you know, ever since I told that truth the first time in, in the the grand jury, I I knew I had to you know, scream the truth from the top of my lungs. You know, unfortunately then I knew that everything I said to the grand jury was sealed. And uh, the only way would, what I said in the grand jury, the only way that would come out was if, if the investigation went forward and sure enough it got shut down. So um, I went on a, a big news program in the United States called 60 Minutes. I told the truth there. Um, that, was a, that was a way to start. And then. I, but there was a lot more, a lot more to say than just you know the 40 minutes or so that I got on, got on, on uh, the 60 minutes program. So I decided to write a book and really spell the whole thing out. Um, yeah, you know it was hard, but I, you know, I'm tough. Yeah, and it was, uh, but it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy, you know. Obviously, once Lance told the truth or part of the truth in front of Oprah, you know that that that. Uh, <laughs> That helped, that helped, but um, I don't know. Once, once I got on the right track, it, it, it felt so good, I didn't really care what other people said about me, so. Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, man, it, it was awful, awful. Um, you know, I mean, I did get out and ride my bike a lot, ride out my frustration, but it was, yeah, it, you know, that would, uh, the relief would only be for a few hours, and then you know, it'd come back. It, I was haunted. I was haunted for pretty much that whole time. Awful. So yeah, I mean, I tested positive in September of 2004, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know when uh, the exact time when I officially told the truth, but it was, yeah, it was almost a decade. You know, and uh, yeah, it was awful, awful. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, I've taken a bit of a break from cycling. You know, I think it's probably healthy for me, healthy probably me for others too. Um, it's been kind of nice. I did it for a long time at a high level under a lot of stress and pressure. Um, I'm sure I'll get back into it someday, but it's been nice. And I just, I love, I love nature. I love being outside. I live in Montana now. And um, I get out, hike a lot with my dog, I ski a lot in the winter. I do some volunteer ski coaching. Um, Summertime, I paddleboard a lot on the rivers there. Yeah, it's kind of, I, I'm just enjoying being kind of a normal guy now, and not really some special athlete. But yeah, but it's a beautiful sport. I love it. I really do love it. Yes, sir. Yeah, tough, tough. I wish, I wish you didn't ask that question. That's one of the toughest ones. Tell them, you know, yeah, I lied straight to my parents. My mom never asked me to my face, but my dad did a couple times just because, you know, I was in the press a lot about doping. Yeah, I lied straight to his face. I became a pretty good liar, you know. And once you start lying, you know, it becomes easier. It's kind of the snowball effect. But yeah, I told them um, just before that 60 Minutes program aired. I think it was the two days before I sat my whole family down and told them. Yeah, it was hard, very hard. But that's the last time I'll have to do that. So um, yeah, I wouldn't recommend having to do that. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's getting there, getting there. What about, what about the money that flows from? Yeah, it's all gone. It's all gone. It's all gone, yeah. But um, if I could give it back, I would, yeah. Yes, sir. Um, New Zealand's a small country, and we, we punch above our weight in high-performance sport. What's that? Sorry, we, uh, we're, we, we punch above our weight in high-performance sport. Yeah. In the last two Olympics, yeah. uh, our athletes have been denied yeah. Either for the gold medal, um, Valerie Adams or Nick Willis. Yeah. Previous Olympics, yeah. Get the silver on the on the podium. Yeah. 
podium. <coughs> those athletes haven't, um, there's been no remorse shown. Uh, those athletes who denied them those medals. Yeah. There's, athletes, there's former athletes in this room yeah. who have also been in that same situation. Have you reached out to the athletes that you have denied either prize money or medals? Um, I've apologized to the ones that I've seen face to face. Um, I, you know, the ones, not I guess not everyone, not everyone. A lot of the guys I was competing against were, you know, it's pretty fair to say, yeah. Yeah, I didn't, you know, I, I don't feel like I know apology. You know, I gave back the gold medal, and uh, they gave the gold medal. I, I thought they should hold on to it for a while before they gave it to the second place guy, the silver medalist. But they, no, but they did, and I'm not going to apologize to him, but that's okay. Or, or the rest of the guys that, you know, I think they understand. That's, maybe someday we'll look each other eye to eye, I don't know, but. I feel I feel pretty solid on that one, but yeah, to the clean athletes, uh, absolutely. I'm a, I, I feel bad, absolutely. Yeah, Hamish. Hey, um, Hamish Carter, Olympic gold medalist, right here, Athens. You know, that's a tough, I've, I get that question once in a while. You know, I, 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 uh, I'm, I'm proud of, like, I, of the, I climbed the ranks pretty quick. I was a downhill ski racer up through my sophomore year in college. And, um, and then all of a sudden I had a back, I broke my back my sophomore year training with the ski team. And then when I got out of bed, they, the doctor said I could ride a road bike. And, um, and then, then from, the, I, I picked it up pretty quick and I, I, I always, I always loved being the underdog, and I, 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 um, those years just climbing the ranks up till basically up till that you know point that I took that first red testosterone pill. I climbed the ranks super super fast, and I was um, I was pretty proud of that. Pretty proud of that. But yeah, one individual result. I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, there were some results that when I was doping, yeah, that stick out but I don't really I don't really look at any of that that to me that's I can you can delete my whole career that you know once I took that first red egg yeah and that's all right um there were a lot of it was a cool experience that whole just racing in Europe and racing at a high level in the Tour de France that's for sure yes sir absolutely so, uh, what do you uh what, you want to expand on that question yeah, well, there well there was a time I didn't feel there were people following me for a little while. It was you know when that there was that first investigation that I told you that I got thrown out. Yeah, I was getting followed by private investigators and stuff from I think I know who, but um, yeah, it was kind of a scary time. I had baseball bats at all my doors. I came I, I for a while I was, for a while I was thinking about buying a gun just to have it in my house, but I never did that and I decided to move to Montana. So I feel pretty safe there. It's a good community. Uh, but no, today I, f I feel fine. I don't know. I don't look over my shoulder anymore. I used to a lot. Um, I don't know if I should be looking over my shoulder, but I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. Good question. Yes, sir. Hey, how are you? Very well, thanks. Good. What, what happens next, Tyler? You, I know you, you had an important meeting last week. What, what is the future? When is this going to be drawn to a close, if ever? What? What was the last part? Um, when will this process come to a close, if, if ever, if ever? I don't, yeah, I don't know. It's, you know, I'm just, I'm not really looking too far in the future. Um, you know, it's sort of the gift that keeps on giving, I call it. It's, um, well, you know, last week I had to testify, and I don't, even, I don't know if I'm you know, supposed to talk about it, but heck, why not? Uh, yeah, I was in a deposition last week, you know, the U.S. government versus Lance Armstrong. So yeah, who knows? That could drag on for years, for years. So, um, you know, for me, it's if they call me in, I call me in. It's no problem. Tell the truth. You know, once you start telling it, once you have the truth behind you, that's not, you know, it's a, not a fun situation, but it's also not really, it's it's not stressful. Like when I was, you know, back when I was lying about it, it was every, you know, you have to cover up your lies and cover up the lies that you made to 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 cover up the big lie. And so, it was a stress, very stressful life. Um, but yeah, now it's a little bit different, a little bit different. But yeah, this could, it could last for a long time. You know, as long as people want me to uh, come and hear some of the stories that I have to tell or some of the things I went through, you know, 
I feel like that's it's an obligation for me to to tell them. It's not the easiest thing in the world to do, but it's it's I think it's important. You know, I wish I had heard a story like this when I first was arrived at the pro ranks. You know, my one of my first teammates, or in 1996, my second year as a professional, um, I was overwhelmed that one of my teammates was going to be uh, Andy Hampston. He won the Giro d'Italia in, I think, 88 or 1988, I believe. Andy was in his last year of his career. And uh, so he was on my his way out. I was on my way in. And he totally, you know, he didn't know what to say to me. He never said it. He never warned me. But he, um, he, you know, he couldn't get out of the sport fast enough. He knew what was going on. He was competing clean. And... Um, but he felt he felt bad for all the new guys heading in. Um, anyways, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Keep your eyes open, listen to your gut, be, be honest with yourself. It's, you know, you, don't, don't go that route. Don't go that route. If, you know, if, if um, you know, be honest with yourself, do, compete clean. You know, if you don't, you're going to get caught up. Like, look, look, at, look, at, look at what's been in the cycling's wake. Look at everything that's happened. You know, it's, it's not a pretty sight. Hopefully that's enough. Um, No, no, never, never. I, uh, I remember back then, you know, there was no internet, so it was like, you, Velo News was our thing in, in the States. It would come out like once a month, and you'd read that thing from, you know, it was like a diary. You'd read it from, you know, cover to cover. Uh, you know, once in a while, there might be an inkling of something with doping, and but really, you had no idea. And like, once I, I started racing professionally in 1995, I was more of a domestic professional team racing stateside. We'd, we'd do trips to Europe. You know, you, you kind of wonder a little bit just about, you know, you do really well in the States, and then all of a sudden you get to Europe, and it'd be like, wow, this, you know, it's a lot faster. You know, maybe in the States there was 15 or 20 guys who were really, really good. And, and in Europe, it was, you know, 150 at least, and it was unbelievable. Um, so you started to have questions, but nobody sat me down. Nobody sat me down. And that's unfortunate, but, you know, I feel I'd much rather be a cyclist coming into the sport today than, you know, back in the, the dark days, that's for sure. So, you know, we've, we have come along, although it might look, not look like it, we have come a long ways, you know. I mean, kid, the, you know, the younger generation, they know, they know a lot of what's happened. They know, they know some of the crossroads that might be ahead to look for. You know, back then we, yeah, I don't know. Nobody talked to me about it. C'est la vie, I guess. Good question. Yes, yes, ma'am. Um, well, yeah, I mean, the, in, in my opinion, like, the, that team doping has, you know, back when I, when I first started, you know, they were handing out white lunch bags with, you know, doping products in it, and they'd be, they'd be at the races in France, you know, with these things. Like, it's come along, that, that, that's changed, like, a, a ton. Um, as far as I know, there's no more team doping. It's more individually based, as, as far as I know. I can't speak with 100% certainty because I'm not in that world anymore, but um, that's what I kind of see from the outside. You know, the guys who are doping, I, I believe it's, it's um, on an individual basis now. 
that's a good sign. We've come a long ways, that's for sure. Um, but again, there's still a lot of work to, do, to be done. Good question. Uh, there was a question over here. Was that? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I think about it sometimes. You know, I get a ch health checkup once a year, and it's, you know, so far so good. But um, yeah, I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. That's for sure. But I, yeah, I think about it. I do think about it. Yeah. Yeah. I think the European public thinks, with, in terms of doping, they almost, it seems like they already knew. You know, back when I was racing, it was almost they, they knew. And um, I think they, yeah. When they, you know, when, when the Americans found out about the big secret, they were pissed off, very pissed off. And, you know, they had a hard time forgiving if, you know, and they haven't all, they have, certainly haven't forgotten, but they, weren't weren't happy a lot of the i think the european public there it's almost like they they accept it a little bit or a little bit more than i think than most other countries um probably due to the you know it's cycling's an old old sport it's been around a long time and it's its roots are in europe um you know i knew of riders their parents bought them stuff drugs and their parents would make sure the refrigerator was loaded with drugs when they got home from a big big race you know I knew or heard stories about um, riders. Their, their parents would come in to watch the Tour de France in the you know, camper van and would have doping products there for them that's, that they could do on an individual basis during the tour. You know. Yeah. Do you question uh, Led Zeppelin's music? Do I question Led Zeppelin? I haven't had that vision before. I'll s I, I will think about it. I will think about it. <laughs> Say it again. <laughs> they don't know what it's about. <laughs> okay. It's Courtney, right? Is it? What's your name? Courtney, yeah. I'll, I'll, let me think about that, and I'll get back to you after. I like it. It's a good question. That's a good question. Uh, yes, sir. Um, what do you mean organized crime? Like, just... Yeah, I'd heard about, there were some, you know, I'd heard about, you never know, yeah, there was, there was, you know, there was betting that happened in cycling. You, you I mean, the closer people were to the sport, you know, they, you know, certain guys are, a lot of riders will train through, you know, the springtime, train through those races, and, you know, they, they're going into the races just as training, so they're, they're, they're just going to be pack fill, and, um, you know, the closer you are to that inner circle, the more you know who's going well, who's not going well, who's really targeting these races. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I'm sh for sure there was inside information on the betting. In terms of people in races buying races, yeah, I'd heard about that a little bit. Not a lot, but I'd heard, you know, you never know 100% because it's not like the rider's like, hey, I bought this race, you know, but it definitely happened. And, off, you know, stuff was, offers were made. They weren't always accepted, but they were definitely made. That's another part of, you know, that's another part for the, um, I was talking to Graham Steele about it last night. It's another problem that they're having to deal with. Yeah. It's not, again, it's not, all this stuff is not going away. It's getting, that's why we have to work even harder. When, when, you, when you first testified, yeah. the, uh, I'm ashamed to say that uh, I thought you had a bit of a bad up. Oh, really? So, uh, I just wanted to apologize. Oh. <laughs> No, thank you, thank you.
<laughs> yeah, these are great questions, by the way. Yeah, that's a good question. He was, you know, he was the most, the best cyclist I've ever rode with, you know. And I don't know if you want to hear that, but he was, he was, ama he's an amazing athlete, amazing athlete. Uh, I mean, he was born to be an athlete for sure. He, I mean, he was born with. I don't know if you ever saw like a picture of him in a time trial. He had this like third lung that went out his back, you know. He really did, and just amazing. I, tr you know, and I spent a lot of time training with him, and you know. I, I never trained harder, to, you know, or some of my toughest days training was, were with him, for sure. Um, what was the next part of your question? Sorry. But, oh, yeah. You know, I think he would have done well. I, you know, to win, I don't think he would have won seven. Yeah. I'm pretty convinced on that. Um, but he's definitely a good athlete, a good athlete. Uh, and it's not fair to say, you know, uh, he likes to, he likes to say, since everybody was doping, you know, I won, I won these fair and square equally. But it's not the case, you know. The, big, the bigger of a rider you were, the more money you made, the more you invested in doping. You know, the, you hired doping doctors and, um, you know, blood doping was an expensive uh, uh, doping practice, for sure, that not all riders could do. So uh, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a level playing field by far. So... Any more questions? How's it going? Oh, yeah, Sarah. We'll get to you in a second. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I think the Tour de France is too bloody hard. <laughs> yeah. You know, a couple of years ago, you know, this is when we're going through this whole scandal and all that. And a couple of years ago, they, on the second to last day, I mean, the last day is the, you know, Shams Lise day. So it's really the last big day. And they go twice up Alpe d'Huez. Like, what? That's, you know, maybe on the first week, do that when everybody's fresh. But the last, the last day when everybody's gazooked, you know, done. Like, that, that to me was surprising and, you know, disappointing. You know, I wish they were doing more, but you know, it's uh, with the new president, Brian Cookson. I, you know, he was handed a tough task, that's for sure. Um, I think he's doing a good job so far. Um, but it, you know, somewhere in that report, that CERC report or whatever, uh, I didn't read the whole thing, but I kind of skimmed over it, and I, you know, they were said somewhere between 20% and 90% are still doping. So that's a, <laughs> but but even if it's 20%, you know, that's you know, one out of every five, and if you think about that, and there's 200 guys in the start line in the tour, I don't, you know, that's, um, what is that? What's the math there? No, but that's a significant amount of guys, and you figure they're all in the front, or closer to the front. That's still not good enough, in my opinion. I don't like, I don't like to hear that. Um, I, 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 yeah, I wish there was a little bit more pressure for the truth to come out. I mean, we've only heard, unfortunately, like, we've heard a lot of you know, um, what's the word? We've heard a lot of disappointing things from from that from the past, but there's a l trust me, there's a lot more that hasn't been told. You know, we've, we've only heard about that much. And I think and I think it's important to get some more out and I get people to be truthful and honest. And I think the people that are truthful and honest, I'm not saying they have to leave the sport. These new these directors or managers, but like, if we are true about cleaning up the sport and like really. Um, you know, I really truthfully want the sport to be, you know, on the cutting edge of being clean. I think we have a lot of work to still be, to still be done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not a whole lot. Let's see. I've talked to Frankie and Drea a little bit. I talked to Betsy, his wife. She's funny. She's great. Um. Yeah, a few, a few, but not many. You know, a lot of the guys, um, a lot of the uh, ex-U.S. Postal, postal guys, I think, you know, they kind of said what they had to and kind of they're all trying to move on. And I think they're, 
I don't think they really want to talk about it a whole lot. And I, you know, I understand. But you know, for me, I feel, I feel like doing doing what I'm doing now is important. You know, I don't think they're really that interested in it. So yeah. Um, do you have a question, yeah. Daniel? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Again, I'm far from that inner circle anymore, so I don't know. But, um, you know, it's encouraging. Like, we recently just had a couple doctors that were suspended. You know, that's, I think, the first ever, or at least in cycling. That's encouraging. Um, they're, so they're cracking down. Um, someone told me recently Ferrari still e existing somehow, some way. Yeah, so, you know, again, we got to keep working hard. And it's not, doping didn't, didn't end in 2006 like a lot of cyclists had said and it's continuing and it's um you know if anything it was pretty we after the 98 tour after the festina affair you know things went underground um but i think i think it's even further underground now you know now you know after what's happened there's been a lot of you know the people that are still doping it's you know it's double top secret now you know not only baseball hats and sunglasses they probably have full costumes so yeah, yeah, I'll be around, so feel free to come up to me and ask me any question. But um, hey, thanks a lot for having me here, you guys. I really appreciate it. And, um, <laughs>